the north of Australia, a straight border divides the island of New Guinea in half. Irian Jaya lies to the west, and Papua New Guinea to the east. <laughs> It is a journey to a remote and archaic world, which is still completely unexplored and is inhabited by more than 1,000 different cultures. The island was much feared by sailors until well into the 20th century because of the ferocity of the tribes that lived there, most of them cannibals and headhunters. It was a land of constant tribal wars, where official records show that even today, more than 6,000 people are shot with arrows every year. Through this rough territory, marked by tall mountains and deep valleys, run hundreds of rivers infested with crocodiles. A number of pigs, from dowries to plots of land. Life unfolds around the popular markets where fruit, vegetables, and fresh fish are sold and have to be protected around the clock from the voracious flies. Just a few kilometers from the capital, we find the deep heart of Papua, an unknown land where people still use stone hatchets and light fires using natural methods. Each tribe has its own distinctive colors, which vary according to the occasion. This is the language of makeup, a visual expression of one's state of mind portrayed with signs and drawings that are hard to translate. They spend a lot of time making these designs, which define their identity and confirm their membership in the community. Here, the interests of the group come before those of the individual. It is easier to survive if the clan is strong and united. The Papuans are rooted in their customs and in their land, and they are proud of maintaining their ancestral culture. This scene could have taken place thousands of years ago. Man domesticating fire, creating it with his hands, emulating the gods who were able to throw thunderbolts and with them, the sacred fire. <laughs> Gathered around the fire, these people have survived the centuries, wars and natural catastrophes. But now they face an even greater danger the pressure of the globalized culture that is slowly but inexorably contaminating. Now we travel to the northeast in search of the Inga and the smoked mummies on their sacred cliff. They live in a very mountainous region, covered with lush vegetation, which is well preserved. Each family unit lives in a small village. They don't gather in large towns, and these villages are usually located in the upper reaches of the mountains. From up there, they have a better view to spot the arrival of strangers. Until only a very short time ago, this region was inaccessible because of the constant tribal warfare. The Inga, 
also called the Kukuku, have always been feared as ferocious warriors who until just recently practiced cannibalism. Even today, there are isolated cases of the consumption of human flesh. They believe that they acquire the qualities of the deceased, strength, bravery, youth, wisdom, by eating his flesh. They are impressive hunters. They handle their bones with surprising skill. Every day, they practice their aim in family contests that serve as training sessions. Following traditional customs, the Kukukuku place the mummified bodies of their dead in natural shelters, caves, and even in the tops of the tallest trees. Once the funeral was over, the cadaver was placed in the kitchen of the deceased's home and they began to smoke it. This process could last two or three months. When the body began to smell, the deceased's wives rubbed his skin with rough rocks until they had scraped it all off. Then they removed the internal organs, which were eaten by the deceased's closest relatives. They believed that in this way, they acquired his personal qualities. The smoking process continued until the flesh was dried out completely. In almost all of Papua New Guinea, the huts are built with bamboo. They tend to be roomy, as large as the family is. Normally, several generations live in the same home until they need more space. Then the eldest son builds his own home and moves there with his wives and children. They make the roofs with thick layers of palm fronds to ensure that they're waterproof. Both the exterior and interior walls are made with crushed bamboo. They weave the bamboo to make thick panels that keep the water out. Each year, when the rainy season ends, they rebuild those parts of the house that show the effects of the weather. They last three years at most in good condition. virgin areas, the rivers are still home to a great variety of fish life. They learn to fish with spears from childhood. They are uniquely skilled at locating fish in these turbulent waters. Our journey continues as we head northwards to the Sepik River Basin one of the remotest areas in Papua New Guinea. Large ships navigate its deep waters. It is one of the biggest rivers in the world. Its headwaters lie in the tall mountains of the Central Highlands, from where the river flows 1,126 kilometers to its mouth on the Bismarck Sea in the Pacific Ocean. The lives of the inhabitants of the regions along the sea are closely linked to the river. It is estimated that more than 200 different ethnic groups live in the Sepik River Basin. The homes are stilt houses that rise quite high over the ground. The river's water level rises between 5 and 6 meters at the end of the rainy season, flooding the low areas and widening its bed several kilometers. Fish is the basis of the inhabitants' diet. Dried and smoked, it is the main product they trade with the inland tribes. Like all the ethnic groups in Papua New Guinea, the inhabitants here also love Sing Sing, as they call the songs and dances that they perform whenever they have the chance. They wear traditional dress, and adorn themselves with a large number of amulets, necklaces, bracelets, and headdresses. They highly value the small shells called cowries for their magical properties. 
Not long ago, they were used as currency. They carve wooden figures of their gods and protective spirits, which they worship to ask for their protection. These sculptures are very crude and simple. Sometimes they represent a much honored ancestor of the group. Humans have been present in the Sepik River Basin, which covers a surface area of 78,000 square kilometers for some 40,000 years. The first contacts with outsiders were made with Chinese and Malay bird of paradise hunters. In 1885, the German zoologist Otto Finch became the first European to reach the area, and he named the river the Kaiser in Augusta in honor of the wife of the German emperor, William I. The crocodile houses, whose roofs imitate the jaws of these reptiles, are religious buildings. Women and children are forbidden from entering. Inside, they are decorated with small scenes from daily life, like stories. Gods and religious ceremonies are also represented. Outside, on the riverbank, a totem pole carved with depictions of their gods indicates that the sanctuary is nearby. They build enormous houses. On the main facade, the representation of a family spirit protects those who live within. Bamboo is again the most important building material. They use strips of bamboo to tie and join the frame and to make the floor. The walls and roof are made with the bark of the sago palm. virgin territory that is full of life. Sago is the staple food of these peoples. It is the daily bread in the Sepik region. They get it from the heart of the sago palm. Once they have crushed the pith of the palm, they knead it through a sieve and extract the starch, which swells considerably as it is cooked. Each sago palm can yield from 300 to 350 kilograms of sago. Once the starch is dried, it is grated to make flour. It isn't necessary to knead the flour. It is placed directly on the fire on clay plates that serve as a griddle. They turn the resulting pancake several times to make it firmer. Then, before folding it over, they moisten it with water to make it swell up. Then they put it back on the fire until it is golden brown on both sides. Its flavor is similar to that of wheat bread, although it is a bit tangier. is very difficult. The water hyacinths multiply during the rainy season and clog their surface. The aquatic vegetation gets so dense that it becomes impossible to travel by canoe. When these plants decay, they produce tannic acid, which dyes the water the color of strong tea. These waters are called black waters. 
A curious thing happens here. The water hyacinths gradually sink their long, hairy roots into the mud of the river, and little by little, they create structures that become veritable floating islands that slowly move downriver. In the end, the rivers and lakes are covered with a thick green carpet. These waters are tranquil, and yet they can seem a hidden danger. This is the kingdom of the powerful saltwater crocodile, the largest, most voracious, and most dangerous crocodile in the world. It weighs up to a ton, and it is always hungry. It can live in both saltwater and freshwater. Even though they are true man-eaters, they are revered here and considered gods. We are in the dominions of the crocodile men. Their eyes look out from the facade of the house Tambaran, the spirit house, located in the center of every village. Women are not allowed inside the Tambaran. Only men are worthy of living with the spirits that reside in the house Tambaran. The sound of their enormous flutes and the rhythm of the garamuts, or tam-tams, lead the sing-sing, which is performed outside by both men and women. secrets of the spirit world and its obscure laws. of Timbumeri in the southern part of the Chambri Lakes. The calm of sunset gives no hint of the barbarous ceremony that will begin at nightfall. The men want to look like their gods, and so they scarify their bodies so that their skin will resemble the hide of their beloved crocodiles. They make hundreds of cuts in their skin to produce scaly scars. Their nipples turn into reptilian eyes. Despite the fact that the government wants to eradicate it, this chilling practice is still carried out. From inside the Tambaran, we hear the gruff sounds of the big garamuts. They announce the start of the sacred ritual. Like Morse code, this language can travel several kilometers. From the time they are children, they learn to interpret the rhythms. Each action or event has its own rhythm or call. A small secret enclosure represents the heart of the crocodile god. Inside, a group of initiates play the water drums, flutes, and whistles. Outside, the warrior chief strikes the ground with his ceremonial tail. He beats in time with the drums inside the tambaran. The strange sounds they make seem to electrify the air. 
The uninitiated believe the sounds come from the underworld. They are the prelude to the arrival of the gods. the land and a great crack formed in it. The crocodile fertilized the crack, giving rise to all the species. Then it opened its mouth, and from its upper jaw came the sky, and from its lower jaw the earth. From within the enclosure, they move the palm frond, which symbolizes the crocodile's tail. It indicates to those outside that the great spirit, the crocodile god, has appeared. He has answered their call. Dozens of warriors continue to dance and entreat the great god to possess them. Now they have transcended everyday reality. The dance brings them to a level of ecstasy that allows them to reach a different dimension. They experience a hypersensitivity that lets them become one with the forces of nature. They feel more powerful and less vulnerable. They sense the underworld inhabited by their ancestors. They have become reptile men. are led inside the house Tambaran to be initiated in a secret ceremony. They will submit themselves to the torture of receiving hundreds of tiny cuts, which will allow them to become members of the elite. They become crocodile men. are not made in a single session. They usually go through the initiation ritual several times in order to model their skin little by little. <laughs> Magic and witchcraft have deep roots among the inhabitants of the Sibic region. When the sun goes down, the Puri Puri ceremonies take place. <laughs> They form a circle around a small altar that symbolizes the spell that they have to lift, and they consume large quantities of betel nuts, the seeds of an areca palm which contain arecaline, a substance that is a powerful stimulant. Their breath rate speeds up, while their heartbeat slows down. The betel nuts cause them to salivate profusely. They constantly spit on the altar, absorbed by the spell that they have to break. <coughs> the ritual is led by the most experienced healer. His powers must ward off the powerful curses that they must protect themselves from. In the attempt to break the spells, they could be hurt. <laughs> When the time comes, when they feel that the witchcraft they are confronting has been weakened, they pounce on it. Symbolically, they imprison it in the knots in the woven palm frond that they place on the altar.
One last time, the elderly healer invokes the protective spirit so they will give him strength. Then he destroys the charm with a hatchet. We continue our journey through the remote lands of Papua New Guinea, which didn't even appear on the world maps until the early 19th century, when the English and the Germans claimed possession of some of the coastal areas. We are going to climb up to the highlands. The first contact with the natives here was made in the 20th century. That was in 1930, when Michael Leahy and Michael Dwyer were looking for gold, climbed the eastern part, and encountered a group of highlanders. Up there lived a population of one million people who belonged to more than 40 different tribes that were still living in the Stone Age. from another planet. These are the Asaro, the clay men. Each valley in the highlands is home to a different tribe, which traditionally battles with the tribes in the neighboring valleys. The Asaro defend themselves from their enemies in a very different way. They daub their bodies with mud and fashion clay masks that look terrifying. To accentuate their sinister appearance, they add pig's canines and fern leaves to the mask. <laughs> the objective is to scare off the enemy, to frighten the daylights out of him. When he meets up with the Asaro, he should think that he has run into fiendish spirits. <laughs> According to legend, these dissuasive tactics were adopted a very long time ago. The Asaro were under siege by an enemy with many more warriors. They had lost many men and were waiting for the final assault. Then an old man named Pukiro Pode had a dream in which he saw the image of some terrifying gray spirits. That very night, they made the first clay masks. The men put bamboo shoots on their fingers as if they were long claws and smeared their bodies with clay. Just before the sun came up, in the twilight of the forest, the mud ghosts slowly wound their way toward the enemy lines. When they saw them, the enemy warriors fled in a panic, and the Asaro saved their lives. After that first contact with the Highlanders, missionaries and evangelists from all over the world descended upon Papua. It was an attractive prize, more than a million people who lived practically in the Neolithic. 
they threw themselves into the task of converting the heathen. The worst were, and still are, the Protestant missionaries of radical sects like the New Tribes. Today, more than 100 different Christian denominations can be found in Papua New Guinea. Let him talk. Let me give him name long all animal. Go him, bring him. All kind can animal of place. Kiss him all, walk him all animal. Now in this place ground us all. Amy walk him man and marry. All same now, all animal. Amy bring me come long man. Blow give him him name. God him, bring him. The Highlanders don't understand the imported gods. It's hard for them to renounce their spiritual beliefs. The preaching of the missionaries only manages to disconcert them and confuse them. But their traditions are always present. Tribes with their feathers and spears appear at every religious act. People applaud them and cheer them on. This is the true essence of their millinery existence. Many ethnic groups are opposed to the presence of the missionaries, who belittle their behavior, consider them savages, and insist on trying to change their customs and beliefs. They arrive and sit among the worshipers, and even though the preacher tries to keep going, the religious act is broken up once again. Without a doubt, it's the best thing they can do, given the continual attacks on their unique way of life. The human skulls kept in the shrines in their villages remind us that, until just a short time ago, these tribes were headhunters. These are sacred houses where the spirits of their ancestors live. They keep their relics inside, like these ancient kinas. They are shells of mother of pearl carved in a half moon shape, which are still highly valuable today. They use them as a form of money. The kinas are divided into toras, circular seashells with a hole in the middle that were threaded to make necklaces. Nowadays, Papua's official currency is called the kina, and their scents are called Torahs. in the highlands that are still dangerous because of the warlike nature of the tribes that live there. The hunting parties sometimes cross the border of their own territory and enter that of their neighbors. These accidental encounters between different groups don't tend to be very friendly. They're often resolved with flying arrows. Every year, hundreds are killed or wounded for this reason. It's hard to travel through the highlands and not run into some sort of compensation right. These are meetings that are called between two tribes that have a dispute. They sit facing each other. In this case, the ones on the left are the ones who have to pay the compensation. One of them killed a man from the other tribe, and now they're going to discuss what payment his family should receive in compensation. Almost all of them are armed, and it's not unusual if, after arguing for hours, the compensation ritual ends in an all-out battle. <laughs> Each group brings its own interpreter who understands the other tribe's language, or pidgin, a common Creole language that more and more people speak every day. This is the only way to understand each other with the hundreds of different languages that are spoken in the country. 
The discussions can last for days until an agreement is reached on the number of pigs and kinas that must be paid to the affected family. Now there are even more deaths when tribes clash. The arrows and spears are being replaced by firearms. They almost always reach an agreement, but it isn't unusual for them to have to meet again only a short time later in new compensation talks. Pigs represent the wealth of the Highlanders. They are their currency and their staple food. The women are in charge of taking care of them. They are so important to them that sometimes when a sow dies, the women themselves suckle the piglets. Valleys, mountains, rivers, and ravines come one after another as we pass through an abundance of landscapes that attest to the beauty of this island. The luminosity of the tea fields is surprising. The variety of tea that is grown up here is considered one of the best in the world. Close to Mendi territory, we visit the Aneka, who are getting together today to prepare their favorite dish, mono. But while someone who speaks Spanish might think it was a monkey, this mono is actually the small sweet banana that is the basic ingredient of this vegetarian stew. First, they make a big fire and add stones to it so they'll get hot. The whole community helps with the cooking. It's a good excuse to get together and catch up on the matters of the tribe. They scrape the monos with a bamboo knife. The banana mash they get will acquire a texture similar to that of bechamel sauce once it's cooked. They cut up squash. They peel yams and sweet potatoes. They clean grim, a sort of vegetable similar to spinach. And they remove the kernels from ears of corn. They dig a large hole in the ground, which is where they will cook the food. It will be both a pit and an oven at the same time. When they finish digging, they line the inside of the hole with grasses so that the food won't come into direct contact with the dirt. They also break the inside knots of bamboo canes so they can use them to fetch water. Meanwhile, others roll cigarettes. The Highlanders are inveterate smokers. Their cigarettes are very strong because of the bark and plant fibers they make them with. When the stones are very hot, they place them in a pit between banana leaves. Then they begin to place the food in the pit in layers, wrapped in leaves, and they gradually add more hot stones. Finally, they put in the mono puree. They wrap it up well in leaves so it won't contaminate the other foods, and then they place the grim in the final layer. Before they put the last stones in place, they spray the whole culinary invention with a little water. Now the primitive pressure cooker has to work its magic. <laughs> Two 
Two hours later, the food is ready. With great care so as not to burn themselves with the stones, they take out the cooked foods. The truth is, it looks very tasty. The only thing we might add is a little salt. Although it's beautiful, it's a tough land with few inhabitants. Only five and a half million people live in its 400,000 square kilometers. It's an anachronistic world where there are no transportation routes. It's a place of villages and villagers who live in isolation among enormous mountains that reach heights of up to 5,000 meters. Its jungles are still impenetrable virgin forests. It's not easy for the Highlanders to establish relationships. They're forced to turn to the institution of the tenement to find a wife. This winged character is the matchmaker who presides over the meetings of the Tanamet. They are exogamous clans, so they must find a spouse outside of their own village. Marriages among relatives are taboo. They invite women from another village to participate in the courting. The men can have as many wives as they can provide for, but the women can have only one husband. The songs speak of amorous encounters and set out the obligations that the future spouses will acquire. Following the instructions of the matchmaker and under the attentive gaze of the older women who brought the girls to the Tanamet, the men change places so that they court all of the women. Both the men and the women wear bright makeup to incite a strong sexual attraction. The choice of a mate must be mutual in order for the matchmaker to accept it. The tanamets are held when the dry season begins and last weeks. The girls go to the different villages that they are invited to to choose their future husbands. At the end of each tanamet, each man sits beside the woman he likes. They cross their legs and hold hands. In future meetings, they will confirm their choice. One of the most singular and populous groups in the highlands are the Huli. They live in the western part, around the city of Tari. Their first contact with the white man was in 1935. They are easily distinguished by the yellow color they use in their makeup. Almost all of them grow beards. They hang the beak of a cassowary on their back as a symbol of the strength of a warrior. They make their large tri-cornered hats with their own hair and adorn them with flowers and feathers. They always hang a hongola, a knife made from the tibia of a cassowary, from their fiber belts. They pierce the nasal septum during their initiation ceremonies. When they are adults, this serves them to adorn their nostrils with pig's canines, feathers, or small wooden sticks.
These are the inhabitants of Papua New Guinea. A journey back through time, a return to our origins. A living culture which is disappearing in the twilight of time and which we should protect. Uh, 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 uh,